Laurie. Well, it's a great pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Professor Chris Holland. Uh, Chris is the founding dean of the Kent and Medway Medical School. Uh, he has a fairly extensive uh, experience in medicine and medical education and a CV to go with it, I might add. Um, he's joined KMS, KMMS from the University of Surrey, where he was a, professor, a professorial teaching fellow and director of learning and teaching for medicine. He also uh, manages to, uh, in addition to his duties as dean, works as a consultant in general adult intensive care medicine at Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells NHS Trust. And if that's not enough, he's currently completing a doctorate in education at King's College London. So uh, an extensive experience and extensive uh, day's work by the look of it. Um, but of course, it seems to me that his love uh, must be KMMS, uh, an experience obviously that he's uh, thoroughly enjoying um, starting, he started it off and he's obviously, it's his, his baby, I'm sure. So without further ado, Chris, it's over to you uh, to tell us all about KMMS. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you for the invitation, Mr. President. Um, I'm going to share my screen and show you some slides. Now, I, um, I'm, I've tried not to make this evening um, just a PowerPoint presentation. So there are some videos in the slides. So, as Les says, I think I have the best job in the world. Um, I do enjoy it. I enjoy it very much and I enjoy every part of it. And uh, KMMS, since I started uh, nearly two and a half years ago now, has become something that's very, very close to my heart. It's very, very close to a lot of people's hearts. So here's a short video to start off with. This is the video that we show the students to welcome them to the medical school. Hello, I'm Professor Chris Holland. I'm the founding dean of Kenton Medway Medical School, and I can't tell you how exciting it is to welcome the pioneer group of medical students to KMM. Right from the outset of planning your program, one of the things that we wanted to do was to be innovative, to make sure that we were preparing you to be 21st century medical graduates and practitioners. My name is Rama Kurnamachandra. I'm Vice Chancellor and Principal of Canterbury Christchurch University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our founding cohort of Kenton Medway Medical School students, the culmination of seven years of hard work since I came to Canterbury and set out on a mission to establish a medical school. It was clear to me that Kent was the county, the largest county in the country without its own standard on medical school. I'm Karen Cox and I'm the Vice Chancellor at the University of Kent and it is a huge pleasure to welcome our founding students. It's so important for our county, it's so important for our nation that we're generating the next generation of medical doctors. We've really built a strong community here involving two universities, their student unions, the people and citizens of Kent and Medway, as well as the NHS and all the professional groups there. One of the most important skills for a 21st century doctor is the ability to communicate well with their patients and with the interprofessional team. And here, Kenton Medway Medical School has really taken the opportunity to innovate, and we've built the first high fidelity general practice simulation suite in the country. Working across the University of Kent and Canterbury Christchurch University and with our NHS partners, we're absolutely delighted that we've got to this point. We've been able to create a medical school for the County of Kent. We've got expertise across being able to deliver clinical learning, scientific expertise. An important part of the Canterbury Christchurch University contribution is the fact that students will study side by side with 3,000 plus health students who are studying from a range of health disciplines, from nursing, midwifery, physiotherapy, all the way through to allied health professional subjects. Together with the University of Kent's traits in biomedicine and biomedical sciences and the research traits, we provide a complementary platform for the medical school to flourish. Two years ago when I was appointed as finding dean for KMMS, I think it's safe to say that none of us expected that the medical school would open under these circumstances. And one of the things that's really helped us are our values that have really kept us focused on being innovative and brave. As a result, we have one of the most exciting medical student programs in the country. 
The support, input and advice that we've had from our contingency medical school, Brighton and Sussex Medical School. And of course, we couldn't have done this without the support of the NHS across Penton Medway. They've been invaluable in supporting KMMS over the past two years and continuing to do so until our first graduates practice hopefully remaining in Penton Medway. One of the ultimate objectives and goals of the medical school is to ensure that we have a positive contribution and impact on the health and well-being of the population of Kenton Medway. And we're making a real difference every day to people's lives. So thank you very much for the support that we've had already and we look forward to continued support into the future. So there were a number of things there that um, may not have been immediately apparent, but that short video is what we showed to our medical student or showed to our medical students when they started. And one of the things you'll have noticed is that in addition to me, there were two other uh, people mainly talking and that was two vice chancellors. And that's one of the things that makes KMMS almost unique in the country in that our medical school is supported by two universities, the University of Kent and Canterbury Christchurch University. There are only two other joint university medical schools in the country. One is Brighton and Sussex Medical School, with whom we have a very, very close link because they are supporting us in our journey to graduate our first cohort. And the other joint medical school is uh, Hull York Medical School in Yorkshire. So what makes KMMS unique? Well, we think that uh, obviously we're the first medical school in Kenton Medway, but we really wanted to stand out particularly in the way that we teach our medical students, not just about how to be a doctor, the education and training to be a doctor, but also how to use research and do research and bring that all together to provide person-centered care. So always keeping the patient at the center of everything that we do. And we do need to look to the future and the, the, the events of the past uh, 12 months have gone a long way to show that no matter what you may be planning for, there's always something around the corner that's disrupting, going to disrupt things. So nobody thought that we would open a medical school in the context of a pandemic. But one of the things that we did know was that during the, life, the, the professional lifespan of our graduates would be that in the course of their professional careers, they would end up spending a lot of time having virtual consultations. Now, if any of you have had any interaction at all with the health service over the past 12 months, particularly with your GP, that was almost certainly uh, online in some shape or form. And that just goes to show how quickly things can change and how much we uh, need to prepare our graduates with multiple skill sets for things that we can't even imagine at the moment. In particular, you'll have heard in the video that, we're, that we take uh, our mission to widen participation very, very seriously. Now, in universities and higher education, what widening participation means, it means giving people the opportunity to come to university, and in our case, to study medicine and become doctors, to those people who you wouldn't traditionally think of as coming to study medicine. So we really want to make sure that people from different cultural and social and economic backgrounds have the opportunity to study medicine because that diversity in our medical school and then through into the NHS has been proven not just to be a good moral thing to do and a right moral thing to do, but it also improves healthcare by making sure that the healthcare system reflects the population that it serves. There are significant health inequalities in Kenton Medway, and so the medical school is deliberately positioned in Kenton Medway to address those. And despite those, despite those issues that the healthcare system has in Kenton Medway, we need to make sure that our students have an excellent experience. Because one of the things that we do want our students to do is when they graduate, they, we want them to actively choose to stay in Kenton Medway. And in particular, if they wish to become general practitioners or mental health professionals, we want them to feel sure that they can have a professionally satisfying and high quality career in Kenton Medway if that's what they wish to do. So we're about halfway through our first academic year. How did we do when we started? Well, we had um, one and a half thousand applications for our 100 
uh, funded places. We have eight students who are paying their own fees entirely. And out of that one and a half thousand, we invited nearly 300 for interview. And we made offers to 103 home, and this was pre-Brexit, so home EU students. We have a 40-60 male-female split, which is very uh, norm, uh, normal for medicine today. And 29% of our 29, so nearly 30% of our uh, students have already got another degree. But in particular, the things that we're most proud of is that 37% of our students came from one of those widening participation backgrounds that I mentioned, and that is streets ahead of many other medical schools. And particularly pleasing, 25% of our students, their uh, uh, vacation address, the address that they live at when they're not at university, was in Kenton Medway. So we've recruited a lot of local uh, people to come and study medicine with us. We're also recruiting academic clinical staff. And so we've got um, a growing number of people who have come both to work in the medical school, but also contribute to the um, uh, healthcare system in Kenton Medway. So I work clinically in Maidstone Hospital, as you heard. My deputy is a GP in Faversham. Uh, the picture of the man with glasses uh, and the nurse uh, beside him that you saw, that's uh, Dr. Schoolman, and he's our head of assessment and he works in accident and emergency in Ashford Hospital. I'm going to show you another quick video now. This is just a photo montage of all of the students in our first year. So heads and shoulders shots of all of our first year students. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that, 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 that series of headshots just goes to show that we really have stayed true to our mission and we've really succeeded in getting a really diverse group of people. I don't yet know them all by their first names, but despite how we're teaching the program almost, um, well, in the majority online at the moment, um, because of obviously the pandemic, um, I do know a lot of them and they're just truly wonderful people who are uh, really inspirational people to be around on a, on a daily basis. This is our, this is our um, academic and professional services team. Uh, this is the last time we were all together in the same place. So this picture was taken just over a year ago. The very next day, the country went into lockdown. The team in the 12 months has now doubled in size. And we don't have a picture of us all together. And it's a quite challenging at times to um, lead and inspire and motivate colleagues who, you've, who work with the medical school, but you've literally never met them physically, shaken hands with them or had a sit down coffee with them. Uh, it's one of the many challenges that we're all facing at the moment. But coming to start a medical school, coming to be part of that, people do find it inspirational and my team constantly humbles me in how motivated and dedicated they continue to be. So what, what, what are the other things that we think make KMMS special? In the first video, you saw pictures of these two buildings. This, the building on the left is uh, the STEM building, Science, Technology, Health, Engineering and Medicine. It's now just in the past couple of weeks got its official name. It's the Verena Holmes building. And if you look Verena Holmes up on Wikipedia, you'll find that she was one of the iconoclastic uh, female first engineers of the 21st century, she re and she has very strong connections to Kent. In this space, as you heard Rama, the Vice Chancellor for Canterbury Christchurch, explain, our students work in a uh, simulation suite, our anatomy centre that I'll show you a little bit off in a minute, and also um, they will get to work alongside other health students, engineering students, and technology students. The building on the right is up at the University of Kent. 
It's called the Pears Building, and it has uh, lots of facilities, but the bit of it that we're most excited about is we have another simulation suite there, but this time simulating a GP surgery. In the Verena Home Buildings, we, in the Verena Homes Building, we have our anatomy center. And this is a real first for the county. This is the first cadaveric anatomy facility uh, in the county. Now I'm gonna show you a video. The pictures that you can see, the organs and the skeletons, they're all plastic. And please don't worry, um, that I'm not going to show you any dead bodies, um, but if you uh, feel at all squeamish, um, you might want to, uh, uh, look away for the next couple of minutes. Benjamin Bay Medical School is very excited about the opening of this new building at Canterbury Christ Church University. Our students will have the opportunity in this building to interact with engineering, sports, health, and biosciences students. Canterbury Bay Medical School students will have the opportunity to take advantage of three important facilities in this building. First of those is the Anatomy Learning Centre, the first cadaveric anatomy facility of its kind in Kenton Medway. The High Fidelity Simulation Suite, where our students will learn in a high fidelity simulated environment alongside many other healthcare students. And the Collaborative Lecture Theatre, where our students will have a really innovative and high technology experience of learning in what used to be a very formal and traditional learning environment. So this is the colonial learning space of the Anatomy Learning Center. In this space, our students will learn in small groups about some of the fundamental anatomical knowledge that they need, which will form the foundations of all of their professional knowledge for the rest of their careers. That means that our students will be able to learn using dissection, prosection, and we're very excited that as a modern anatomy learning center, we've been able to integrate medical imaging using techniques such as x-rays, CTs, and ultrasound into the learning that happens here. This is a high fidelity mannequin of a lady at the later stages of pregnancy. It's computer controlled from the computer here, and on it you can see all of the physiological variables that it might be necessary to set. If you watch carefully, you'll see that her chest goes up and down. And if I feel here at her wrist, she has a pulse. But many other physiological features can be simulated as well. So this is one of our clinical skills rooms in the simulation suite. And in this, we don't use mannequins, we use things like this called pipe cast trainers. So this is some simulated skin made of plastic. The students are able to learn how to give different sorts of injections going through the skin, through subcutaneous tissue, through to the muscle. And if you cut this, then students can learn how to suture. A device like this is used to learn how to do cannulation. So in this plastic arm there are veins and students can learn how to put cannulas and needles in. And in the veins we have to take uh, red dye to simulate blood. I think this is what we call a collaborative lecture theatre. And you'll see that rather than series ranks of seats, what we have done is we've organised the seats around small groups of tables. That means that students can, in the middle of a lecture, work in small groups on material that the lecturer has provided them with. Okay, so we opened the medical school in the middle of COVID, um, which was a feat in itself. And we've all clapped for carers. Some of you may work or um, have friends or family who work in the NHS and will know only too well the toll that it's taken on our healthcare system. We're coming out the other side of another surge of the, of the pandemic. And um, already people are talking about how are we going to deal with things like waiting lists and pay for everything that we've done. And whilst the vaccination um, uh, endeavor is definitely a world groundbreaking success, um, there are concerns that we will, we will see future surges as new variants of the virus um, uh, uh, need to be brought under control. Opening a medical school in the context of the pandemic certainly wasn't easy. We've talked about virtual working. This is me uh, in the first surge, getting gowned and masked and putting on all of my PPE to go in and do a ward round with the patients who were suffering from COVID. And the, um, the many of the clinical staff for the medical school were very conflicted in terms of the amount of time that they needed to devote to their clinical work and the, their patients in the NHS, as well as needing to work in the medical school and give that their full attention as well. 
this is what it's like to give a lecture in the, in in social distancing. So this lecture is this lecture theater is up at the University of Kent. It holds 500 people uh, under normal circumstances. In this situation, we're only allowed to put 100 people in it. And this is uh, from me giving a lecture in Welcome Week in September last year to just over 50 of our students. And you can see that they're sitting two seats apart with an empty row between each row of students. So very, very different experience. But we've moved our teaching online. This is a small group tutorial, me with uh, three students talking about uh, cardiovascular medicine. And um, it looks like hopefully um, they're having an enjoyable experience. This is another picture. This is um, the professional services team. And this is us celebrating after um, had receiving some good news from the regulator, the General Medical Council about our progress uh, uh, through our opening process. This is one of our students in Welcome Week. She's taken the black and orange colors of uh, Kenton Medway Medical School very, very seriously, uh, but she's showing off her brand new Kenton Medway Medical School badge. And um, it just shows that, you know, we did, go, we did go to great lengths in the middle of the lockdown in September to give our students time on campus with us uh, to get to meet as many of the team as possible, because we did know that as lockdown restrictions uh, increased from September through to January, we did know that our students would have less and less time with, uh, with the opportunity to spend face-to-face -face time with us. This is a particularly nice pay, uh, picture because the young lady on the left of the picture is one of our first year medical students. And the man, uh, to the right of the picture, he is a retired GP in Kenton Medway, and he has returned to the NHS to help with the vaccination endeavor. And so this is a nice picture that shows two doctors at either end of their career, both working to support the, uh, the, the, uh, the work to uh, deal with the pandemic and the vaccination. Now, opening a medical school is very expensive. It's costing the two universities 50 million pounds. And whilst the universities are fully committed to underwriting that, they're hopeful that our fundraising target of 30 million pounds will go some way towards offsetting that number. We've raised um, 3.9 million, including gift aid from in pledges and income. From the NHS and from the community, we've had uh, the healthcare community, we've had another 2 million last year with another 2 million to come this year. And the Southeast Local Enterprise Board again has gave us four million in our first year of opening, and will give us another four million, uh, hopefully just early next uh, next month when the new financial year starts. We've had some very significant donations from uh, philanthropic trusts. So the Pears Foundation gave us two million. That's why they the building at the University of Kent is called the Bears Building, and we had five hundred thousand from the Garfield West Foundation, and that's um, paying for some. Uh, rooms and uh, fit out of the pair and some aspects of fit out of the pairs building. And we continue to have many other donations from both corporate and personal benefactors. Um, our, uh, uh, um, we, we, we were very badly timed in terms of the pandemic um, because uh, uh, Kent and Medway uh, 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 information technology company called SAR JV um, that produces a lot of software for the, the healthcare system. Um, they nominated us as our charity, as their uh, nominated charity for the last financial year. And this is a picture of Fran running the uh, London Vitality half marathon for us. And unfortunately, um, shortly after that marathon was run, the, the pandemic arrived and um, all events like this were um, cancelled. So we've not really benefited uh, from being SARS nominated charity um, uh, as much as either party would wish. But what's really, really resonating with people is going back to that widening participation endeavor. So coming up to university to study medicine means that you're signing up for five years. It's quite an expensive course. Um, in addition to two extra years, you need to buy everything from uh, smarter clothes than, shall we say, the, the quintessential student in order to go on ward rounds. You need to buy some equipment like stethoscopes, lots of books, 
and other sorts of things as well. So um, it, is, it is a big uh, financial commitment to come and study medicine. And we've raised, for, for our first year, we raised uh, over 20 individual scholarships for our finding students. So these came from a very broad range. Medway Council has provided scholarships for two students now. Uh, Canterbury City Council got in in the act and gave us a scholarship. We've had contributions from banks, Santander, for example, and the healthcare um, community as well. So Canterbury Health Education has given us some foundations. These scholarships make all the difference for some of our students. And I'd like to introduce you to Alfie now. Now, Alfie is from Medway. He's the first person in his family to ever go to university. And um, his father drives lorries for a living. And this is a couple of minutes just about Alfie talking about the, uh, the impact of the Medway uh, Unitary Authority Council uh, Scholarship. My name is Alfie Wayne, and I'm the Medway Council Scholarship holder at KMMS. Considering I'm from Medway and I'm also the first person in my family to go into university, let alone medicine, it is a huge privilege and honour for me to represent Medway with this scholarship. The scholarship makes a big difference to me because it gives me the idea that there are a lot of people that believe in my abilities and are ready to support me. Growing up in Medway, university is a very controversial topic because there are a lot of people who don't like the idea of putting themselves in debt, especially in the case of medicine where the course is longer and so more financially demanding. So I'm very grateful to have the Medway Council Scholarship and I cannot wait to represent Medway as a medical student and as a doctor. And so I would encourage anyone who is looking into medicine to please go for it, try your hardest and look for opportunities along the way. And we really couldn't be more delighted to have Alfie and a couple of other people just like him um, from Kent and Medway in receipt of scholarships. Um, Mal uh, Alfie is a wonderful ambassador to, for us. He does wonderful things like record these short videos and we show these videos um, when we go virtually to visit schools. And it's really, really important that kids um, in schools that don't have an ethos of sending their um, pupils to university or to study medicine, it's really, really important that those pupils get the opportunity to see people like them uh, actually doing it and studying medicine. I need to not over um, over rely on Alfie because he does have to have his own program of studies. He needs to study to be a doctor, but getting people like Alfie and others like him uh, to talk to potential applicants really makes the difference and really makes us stand out in our endeavors. On our website, you'll find other opportunities to give. So you can um, give very large amounts of money and have the opportunity to name things such as a building or a meeting room. Um, for a smaller amount of money, you can become what's called a finding donor and that'll give you the opportunity to be involved in our journey with um, uh, opportunities for newsletters and uh, lunches and social events once we're allowed to do those things. You can make, a, um, you can stipulate that your uh, donation goes towards bursaries and scholarships or um, larger organizations and individuals um, can have the option to support our recruitment activity in terms of staff and endow uh, academic chairs. And um, there's always the um, opportunity to leave the medical school a legacy. And it feels strange sometimes to be so uh, uh, transparent about um, how important these donations are for our endeavor. But at the same time, what we do hear back from the people that we talk to in the county is that feeling like um, they, that people have an opportunity to contribute to the medical school and the success of the medical school is something that people do feel um, uh, is very important and um, very a valuable opportunity. So this is my last slide. What are we, 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 we won't be stopping, we, 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 we won't be resting on our laurels. Um, we have continued our outreach activities and student recruitment uh, virtually over the past few months. I told you that we had one and a half thousand applicants in our first year. We had just about the same this year again. And um, we are in the middle of sending out offers to those applicants and um, Hopefully we won't have a repeat of last year's A-level confusion, um, but we're very much looking forward to welcoming uh, students uh, in September for our second 
first year. Um, we have ongoing outreach activities. These are all happening virtually at the moment. The picture is a picture of one of our programs called Bright Minds, um, which we run in partnership with um, uh, Brighton and Sussex Medical School. So the young man on the left with the blue shirt, he's a Brighton and Sussex medical student. And the man in the black top on the right of the picture um, you can see that he's drawing on a white t-shirt and he's actually drawing a rib cage and the organs inside the chest on his t-shirt and he's a uh, A-level student at one of our uh, schools in Kenton Medway. We're continuing to develop our clinical placements across the county to make sure that our students have those high quality placements and Whilst the core business is to deliver an undergraduate medical program and make sure that our students graduate in 2025, medical schools are so much more. So we're looking at collaborations with other students and other programs in both universities, lots of academics across the two universities, with the healthcare system and with industry in Kent and Medway to build what's called the halo around the medical school, which is about um, supporting the county in many, many more ways other than, rather than uh, just produce doctors. So colleague, colleagues and friends, that's the end of my presentation. I'm more than happy to, be, um, to answer any questions at all about that very, very rapid um, journey through what we're doing uh, for Kent and Medway Medical School. That's great, Chris. Thank you very much indeed. It's very interesting and uh, well done for getting that off the ground through a, a very difficult time for you and your colleagues um, with everything else as well. So that's great. Ladies and gentlemen, usual thing, if anybody has any questions, if you could raise a hand or use the icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you do raise your hand on the screen, if you just leave it up for a few moments, then I won't miss you. So anybody got any questions, please? Yes, Liz, you need to unmute. Ah, we'll find it in a minute. There Is you that go. better? Is that better? Yeah, you're okay. Oh, good. I was just wondering where the students will be doing their clinical work. Will it be doing Canterbury or Medway? Um, it'll actually be across the whole county. So um, our students have already had four uh, separate weeks of uh, placement in general practice and community care. And they've attended practices going from Tunbridge Wells right across to uh, Ramsgate and Margate, and similarly from Gravesend uh, down to the south of the county. Similarly, our um, hospital placements in years three, four, and five will cover the whole county. So Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells Trust, Darren Valley, Medway, Maritime, and East Kent Trust. Ah, lovely. Thank you. There's a good cross section of hospitals there then. Thank you. Anybody else for a question, please? Yes, Liz. Do unmute, Liz. Thank you very much, Chris. Excellent presentation. Um, your first cohort was, I think, just over 100. Um, and presumably you're uh, then going to have new co cohorts each year. Are you, are you uh, in, engaging the same number each year or is the number going up? And what are your plans for expansion? <laughs> That's a very, very good question. So medical students are very expensive uh, in individuals to train and that expense isn't just for the students, they're expensive for the country. And when they graduate, they need to be able to have a job to go to as part of their registration process. So we need to, um, as a country, regulate the number of medical students that we recruit every year. And at the moment in the country, across the four nations, we have seven and a half thousand medical students every year, of which we are only allowed to have 100. And um, I would really like to expand. Uh, everyone is very hopeful that the government um, will see its way financially to increasing the number of medical students that it funds, the medical student places that it funds in the near future. When that happens, um, I would like the medical school to grow to around about 180 to 200 students per year. Thank you. Okay, Chris Cox, I think I saw your hand up. You did indeed. Thank you, Chris. Um, in my former profession of dentistry, it used to be said that most people ended up within 60 miles of home or of their dental school. 
Does this apply in medicine? It obviously, obviously doesn't apply to you, but uh, does it apply, still apply in medicine? Um, yes, it does. So there's a rule um, that's uh, glibly called the 60-20-20 rule, which is what you've just quoted. 60% of students stay, between tw stay within 20 miles of their alma mater for 20 years after graduation. Now, one, I, I, I went once on a uh, treasure hunt to try and find where that statistic comes from. And it seems to come from countries like Scandinavia, Canada and Australia, where you have very, very large tracts of relatively uninhabited land with only a few metropolitan centres. However, having said that, there is truth in the saying, as, as there are with, with, with many of these sort of things that have um, become uh, 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 taken as read. And so we hope that about 20, 25 to 50 percent of our graduates will stay within Kent and Medway. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, David Plenty. Yes, Chris. Um, I was surprised at the statistics for um, female students and male students being so different. Can you give any explanation why that is and it's not an equal number of male and female graduates? Yeah, so that's been a long term trend. When I was at medical school in Queens and Belfast in the early 1990s, that, that year, my year, that was the first year when female students outnumbered male students. Um, and that trend in England had been going on for quite some time during the 80s. There are some medical schools uh, in England now where the ratio is 70 women to, every, uh, to, to, to uh, 30 men. Um, it just seems to be that medicine is a profession that attracts more women than men because this is replicating are up uh, the, the, num the number of people who apply to us. So out of the out of the pool of people that apply to us to study medicine, those proportions are the same. Um, there's all sorts of ideas why. Um, it may well be that men don't want to be doctors anymore. They'd much rather go and work in banks or in IT or start up or, or write an app and get rich that way. Um, all sorts of interesting reasons. Okay. Um, Pete Swain. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, Chris, that uh, the UK needs seven and a half thousand uh, doctors a year, or rather you graduate seven and a half thousand a year. How many do they actually need in the UK? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I, I, I think that it is universally accepted, even by the government, that we still need more. And Kent and Medway Medical School is one of five new medical schools that have opened in the past few years. The other ones being in Anglia, Ruskin and Chelmsford, Lincoln, Sunderland, Edge Hill, just north of um, Liverpool and Aston in Birmingham. Now, though that round of expansion was triggered by Jeremy Hunt in 2016, and here we are in 2020, and my school in Edge Hill were the last two of that tranche of expansion to open. And none of those students will graduate until 2025. So when a politician stands up and says, I'm going to um, open new medical schools, it takes nearly a decade before you see any additional doctors. And then it takes another decade to 15 years before you have fully qualified specialist hospital doctors or general practitioners. So this is a long-term issue that uh, planning the uh, process that spans multiple electoral cycles. And I think that's the key. Um, the Royal College of Physicians in January of this year published a document fairly well researched and well informed saying that we needed to more than double the number of medical students that we have. So we needed to add and they say we need an additional 10,000 students per year. That would be another 20 medical schools in the country. So is it just cheaper to take uh, pre-trained doctors from the rest of the world? We do do a lot of that. Now, a few, a few governments ago, um, 
uh, in the early in the early part of this particular conservative period of leading the country, um, the, the the Conservative Party did say that they would try to manage the migration system to reduce that. However, um, the 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 number of doctors, despite that statement and aspiration, the number of doctors coming to practice uh, in the United Kingdom has still continued to go up year on year. Right. Thank you. Manohar, did I see your hand up? Uh, well, thank you, Chris. That, that, that was a very nice presentation. And having a school uh, locally now, I'm sure is going to change a lot of things for us. Uh, you just mentioned about the number of applications coming in from, well, I happen to be a doctor, so I know at least the applications that have been going in the past always for every seat available, there were usually anywhere be between 1,500 to 3,000 applicants. And surprisingly in Canterbury, where, well, the last 20 years that I, I live here now, uh, I'm aware that very few schools encourage people to go into medicine because um, my own family, I've had two of my boys who followed me and they have gone into medicine. And in both their schools, they were one of the first students who actually wanted to do medicine. So is there anything that you are now going to promote locally? As you said, we want to take local people. So how is the involvement with the schools going on now? We, we do do, thank you for the question. So we do, we do do a lot of outreach activities. You're absolutely right that um, uh, there's a lot of schools in the county that have not really encouraged their pupils to apply for medicine or any of the science, technology and engineering subjects. And this, this is very important. Um, I think that we, or rather, I don't think, I know that we face a particular problem in Kent and Medway that goes, the, the, the root cause of which is the 11 plus. Because if you do not get a good result in your 11 plus, and do not get into a selective school in Kent and Medway, then out of those non-selective schools, there's only a handful, a literal handful, um, where one, when you get to be uh, 16, 17, 18, where you'll actually have the opportunity to study the subjects at A level that you need to get into medicine. So the, 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 the impact of the selective education system is that if you end up in a, if you end up in a non-selective school, you simply cannot, you just can't. At the age of 11, it has already been decided you will not, give, you will not have the opportunity to study medicine because you cannot do the right subjects at A level. Now we have worked very hard with the schools and we have really broadened the A-level subjects that we will accept for our medical school, but there's only a limit to how far you can take that. We are continuing to have a dialogue with Kent County Council, and I don't think that means getting rid of the 11 plus. I don't think that's ever going to, that's, got, that's not going to happen anytime soon, but we are having a, a conversation with Kent County Council and the non-selective schools about how we can address that issue. But it does mean that right now in the current system, we have our outreach needs to reach right back to primary school to encourage primary school students and their parents and guardians to consider doing the Kent test and, and working hard to get a good result. And again, going back to the time scale question, if I have a conversation this year that encourages someone to do well in the Kent test, it'll be eight or nine years before they come to join my medical school. Yeah. Quite a problem, isn't it? Um, David Deng, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, with the uh, hopeful possibility of a new hospital be given consent in Canterbury, what influence do you feel that the new medical school have on this awaited decision? Yes, um, I do get asked that a lot. I am entirely agnostic from the perspective of, the med of being the medical school dean, I am entirely agnostic about where the hospital should go because the hospital should go in the right place to serve patients. And my students will learn in that healthcare system um, that is conformed around what will provide the best patient care. Right, thank you. Yeah. 
There you go. Anybody else, please? Um, Richard. Thanks, I've just unmuted myself. Chris, a more general question for you. Um, because medicine is one of those long courses that uh, go on for five years, similar to dentistry, veterinary and architecture. Um, is there any thought to say that why don't we make these courses more intensive and so do them over a shorter period of time, which would save students money? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm laughing because I actually um, had a long, long conversation at a national level in a meeting this morning about that. The shortest, the shortest that anyone has been able to make a medical program <coughs> is four years. And um, in order to be able to do medicine in four years, you need to already have another degree. And that degree needs to have covered some aspect of human sciences. So not necessarily a healthcare program, but definitely the right sort of background to give you the scientific uh, underpinnings that you need. Buckingham Medical School, which is a private university um, over on the other side of London, they teach uh, a program in four and a half years. Um, and they've done that by shortening the summer holidays. In order, to, in order for a program to be recognized uh, for, um, uh, by the GMC as being making you eligible to, be, to go onto the medical register, it has to include five and a half thousand hours of scheduled teaching and learning. And it's very difficult to fit that amount of time into any less, any shorter a period of time than five years without frankly burning people out. Okay, thanks. Anybody else, please? I can't see any more hands up, I don't think. I think we've had all the questions, Laurie. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you, Chris. That was a very informative uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And I call upon Steve Howell to give the club's vote of thanks. Steve. Okay, uh, Chris, that, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. And. Um, very illuminating. 